Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today, as always, with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios. How's it going, Lance? It's going very well. How are you? Feels good to be here. It does feel really good, doesn't it? And we have a really nice chat, a really fun conversation with Rachel from Crime Museum. The historic uh, monument that celebrates all things crime, including Ted Bundy's uh, VW Bug that he was uh, busted in. Uh, everything from that to um, O.J. Simpson's uh, Bronco. Right. And actually, not O.J. Simpson's Bronco. My bad. The yeah. Bronco from the O.J. Simpson. Chase. Chase. That's accurate. Right. Al Cowling's uh, white Bronco. That's right. <laughs> Things you learn. Yeah, and uh, you're listening to this show right now. This is Crawl Space, uh, True Crime and Mysteries. You know what? You're going to love this museum. So we know you're already interested in the topic. So why don't you just toggle on over to crimemuseum.org, and anytime you're in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, go see it. It's it's a really cool uh, exhibit. It's a whole building. Like you said, Lance, it's got Bundy's VW Bug. It's got... The history of uh, corporal punishment, including... Uh, the electric chair? Yeah. yeah. How weird is that? It's incredible. And Rachel, uh, she has such a great job. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the listeners would just will be so jealous when they listen to her speak and, and they realize that this is something that she does every day. And also, before we throw it to that audio, we just wanted to let you know out there that our documentary, Finding Maura Murray, is finally published on Amazon Prime. So check that out if you want uh, a link to it. it. is It is in the show notes. There are four episodes up there right now available for rent. So please check it out. People are really digging it. And that cost does include a 10%, at least 10% donation to the GoFundMe for uh, anything involving the search for Mora. And we really appreciate the people who watched over the weekend. It was, I guess, officially released uh, on October 19th. Right on time, right on schedule, <laughs> and we got very, very good uh, positive feedback, and uh, those who haven't watched it yet, like you said, toggle on over. That's going to be my new catchphrase, <laughs> I think. But you now, check it out. You know when you watch it, it's a, it's a small amount of money to pay for you know, what you usually would pay for something on you know, rental fee on, on Amazon and you can you can know that you've done something that was is directly helping the the cause of uh, Morris' disappearance. And speaking of helping the cause, Lance, you may be a crawl space listener out there, and you're like, you know, what? I really wish these guys would do more episodes. Well, guess what? This might be the best news you've had all day. This is something that we've been working on quite literally all summer. Uh, probably since Crawl Space launched in uh, <laughs> February of 2017. So it feels good. It feels good to say finally that Crawl Space is going to be weekly. Uh, that means that, that means there's 52 weeks in the year. There's going to be at least 52 Crawl Space episodes this year. So this episode you'll be listening to on Thursday, October 25th, and then we continue every Wednesday subsequently for... 58 weeks. Right. So even more than a year. We yeah. have a 58-week contract, right. and we launched the Wednesday schedule on Halloween. Perfect. So uh, very exciting for us over here at the Crawl Space Studios, everybody. So we really hope you're happy as well. And why is this happening, Tim? Well, we've switched platforms. We've actually switched homes. So uh, we are now with the good family at Midroll. And uh, that's really exciting. Earwolf and Stitcher. We're basically having dinner and drinks with Mark Marin and Scott Ackerman, and Bill Simmons, yeah, and True Crime Garage, among many other successful shows that I listen to, and I'm sure you listen to as well. So, hope you enjoy this interview with Rachel at Crime Museum. Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. And joining us on the line is Rachel from the Crime Museum at crimemuseum.org. How are you, Rachel? Hi, how are you? Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Crime Museum and how it got started? So the Crime Museum goes back to 2008 uh, when we opened in Washington, D.C., our owner was inspired by Alcatraz Penitentiary in California, and he thought, there's so many people that are interested in this topic. Is There should be a museum. And when he found out there wasn't, 
uh, D.C. was the obvious place to go with that dream. Um, So we opened there in 2008. Uh, And then in 2015, we closed in D.C. and actually moved to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, where we now have a crime museum uh, called Alcatraz East. And so that's where you can find a lot of the crime museum collection is now on display at Alcatraz East. Okay, cool. So you kind of changed your branding when you moved to Tennessee? I mean, a little bit. They sort of felt like, oh, we're going to this new place. We should have a new name. Uh, We were able to build our own building there. And so now it looks like a historic old prison in D.C. We had to keep the historic storefront. So it was sort of a fun way to to reintroduce ourselves to a new audience and the public. Uh, But we're still the crime museum. We're always still going to be the crime museum. Um, because that's that's what we do. That's that's what we are. We're a museum of crime and law enforcement. And you sent some uh, representatives to CrimeCon when it was in Nashville last year. What was the uh, reaction from those people? Yeah, so I was there. I was one of those people. Um, it was a great time. It was really interesting. We had never gone to CrimeCon before, so we were we didn't know what to expect. But it was funny because so many of the people there were coming up to us and being like, oh, my goodness, you know, do you know about the museum in D.C.? I was like, yep, hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. That's us. But, um, yeah, we everyone was so excited, so welcoming to meet us and hear about the museum. We're actually able to display more in Tennessee than we were in D.C. We had more limited space there, so it's been really exciting to bring new things to the public and um, – have have new audiences become familiar with us because it's such a popular topic. So many people love the podcast, love the TV shows, and so the museum is a natural. You had a lot of really good, informative promotional material that was very fun to thumb through uh, as we were uh, at our table. Well, great. I'm glad you stopped by. We had a few artifacts on display that people could come check out, a few things from... Gacy and O.J. Simpson hit the hit the highlights, uh, but we wanted to give people a taste of what they'll see when they come to the crime museum. So what kind of artifacts do you have? Well, we cover the history of crime, everything from pirates in Old West, Bonnie and Clyde, John Dillinger, mobsters, of course. Um, everyone is most interested in the serial killers, of course. But then we also have... Uh, galleries on CSI and going through the law enforcement process, um, famous prisons, um, and then our our crime car gallery is very popular. People enjoy seeing the different cars we have to do with mostly famous chases. And yeah, we have everything up to a exhibit on counterfeit crimes. So we do a little bit of everything. There's a lot going on. What's some of the uh, more popular artifacts amongst the staff? Our staff is is so passionate about the museum. It's always really great to see that every from from the museum attendant to our you know group salespeople are so interested in the museum, so passionate about it, excited to be there. Our most requested item, most ask about item that everybody's always so interested in is the Ted Bundy Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, that's what is always number one uh, that people are most interested in. Uh, people really enjoy um, the police badges we have. It's a really popular area that people enjoy seeing badges from all over the country and throughout history. Uh, Pirates is always popular. Uh, we have Jesse James um, holster and guns from his gang. We have John Dillinger's death mask. I think I'd be really interested in the Western one, like the uh, the Jesse James one, because I secretly wanted to be a cowboy, but I know if I were to go back in the 1860s and 70s, I'd probably get some disease and die pretty quickly because I wouldn't be able to take care of myself. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 hard to, when you see it on the movies, it's like, yeah, when someone gets shot, they're dead, it's over. It's not dramatic and romantic. <laughs> I'm sure uh, Bonnie and Clyde were not thinking how romantic it was to be blown to bits outside of their car <laughs> no they were they were they had a very hard life uh, for sure and that's one of the things we do talk about a lot in the museum whether it's bonnie and clyde or gacy or or 
the Broncos, who knows, really trying to dispel a lot of the myths that exist around criminal figures. I mean, there was nothing good about Bonnie and Clyde. They were terrible people that killed people in cold blood. And a lot of movies and TV shows have definitely romanticized them. And I mean, I can enjoy that as much as the next person. But just remembering that they were were criminals and killed people and killed fathers and brothers. And that was part of their story, too. And the same goes for, for Jesse James and his gang. And so we talk about those things. I mean, sure, when Public Enemies, the movie, came out and Johnny Depp played John Dillinger, I mean, who... We're all fans. We get it. But we try to, to cover that balance that not everyone is is all good or or all bad, but just being realistic about how people were in the Depression and how that having those sort of situations uh, were different than certainly a serial killer and finding those nuanced ways to tell those stories. Yeah, I think there's something about having this real life uh, couple, you know, using Bonnie and Clyde as the example in in a high profile movie with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway probably helped the lore of the artifacts, the Bonnie and Clyde artifacts. Um, so I think that that might be an aspect of it. I noticed you have the the Godfather revolver at the museum. Yeah, we have some pieces from The Godfather. We have things from Scarface. We also have real Al Capone things too. Uh, we do get into the pop culture aspects a little bit, too. We have a rabbit's uniform from Gangs of New York uh, because those sort of those movies are so popular, too. So we cover that kind of thing, too. Uh, we always just make clear that, like, this is from a movie. This is a real thing. For instance, getting back to Bonnie and Clyde, the we have the Bonnie and Clyde car from the movie with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. Uh, but we always make clear that... It's not the real car. The real car is in a casino. Um, But from a pop culture perspective, a lot of people are more excited about the movie car because they love that movie so much. And it is a real historic artifact. It is. It's not a prop. It is a real car. And when they filmed the movie, they actually did have the police department come and shoot it up for real. So it's just interesting interesting history from the pop culture perspective too and everything that that movie did for for film history yeah the pop culture element i feel fuels the uh dark tourism that i think is a lot bigger than it's ever been nowadays and you just said that um you you give uh sort of the entire picture the entire scope of the the particular crime so if i'm if i'm looking at ted bundy's car you also get how horrible of a human being this man was. Is that how you balance that, that pop culture dark tourism is to give that entire picture of, of the good and the bad and and all that comes with it? Yeah, absolutely. The way that I like to think about it is, you know, the, the, the famous cliche that if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And what area would that, be more important than the history of crime um, because where is that more important than learning from past crimes and past investigations and how we can prevent those things from happening in the future. So that's really how we try to frame things in the museum. Um, sure, we do have things from criminals on display, but we give the context to the story. It's it's not just about the ghoulish side of things. It's about how they were caught, how the case was Um, taken through the court system, which is usually not straightforward and has lots of twists and turns, especially even with someone like Bundy. The dark tourism is clearly something that comes up, but we do definitely come at it from the law enforcement side that we're not glorifying these people at all. Um, We're trying to help people keep themselves safe, keep their families safe, and learn uh, from, from past mistakes. Blending the pop culture a little bit with the uh, true crime aspect, you have the Bronco from uh, from O.J. Simpson, of course. Uh, the Bronco he drove um, in the slow speed pursuit over there in California. And so what's that like? When uh, people ask things like, well, what is the most surprising thing in the museum? It's It's probably maybe the Bronco because people don't expect us to have it 
Um, which, I mean, I get that. I mean, we're in Tennessee. In in D.C., we didn't have the space for it, uh, so we couldn't display it in D.C. But now we can. And that's another area where we we try to dispel a lot of misconceptions because everyone, if, if I said to you that it was Al Cowling's Bronco, you'd be like, who's that? What are you talking about? So we have to sort of work with the language of like it's the oj simpson bronco but it's not oj simpson's bronco (laughs) because he actually had a white bronco that he owned which was why his friend got an identical bronco which makes it confusing for everyone uh but oj's owned bronco was outside his house and they found dna evidence in it and it was torn apart and and gone over by CSI teams and was later destroyed. It actually belonged to Hertz um, that he was a promotional spokesman for. The Bronco that was in the chase belonged to Al Cowlings, and he was the one driving it, and OJ was in the back on the phone threatening to commit suicide during that chase. Uh, But the Bronco itself did not actually belong to him. So we have the one that was in the chase that everybody knows about and is famous. See, we're learning. We're learning as we go here. I had no idea that, that... <laughs> that's that's what we try to do. Like we we have had to revise the text on the panel with the Bronco several times, and right now it literally says, "Yes, this is the real Bronco." <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that 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 was a Hertz vehicle. That O.J. Simpson, his his Bronco was was a Hertz vehicle because of the promotional material that he did. Uh, with the commercials. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's not surprising at all. You know, that that was a form of payment, but it just adds this element of uh god, like dark dark comedy to it. It you know, it kind of makes you it kind of makes you chuckle a little bit that oh, wow, that that was from his promotional material that we all remember him in, like running to the counter and like Oh, very famous commercial. Over. Yeah, it's yeah. A super famous yeah, commercial. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any artifacts from that commercial? Uh just kidding. Um <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have uh I'm trying to think now. I'd have to I'd have to go look, but we do have his his golf bag with his golf clubs and I think there might be a Hertz like luggage tag on it, but I'd have to go look. <laughs> nice. <laughs> do you think you could get O. J. Simpson to do like a presentation at the crime museum? Well, he is a convicted felon. He is um, for other for other things. So that's not something I think we would get into. Well, if we ever have him on the show, we'll tell him to take a swing by. There there were lots of jokes when he was released about, oh, is he going to come get his Bronco? And of course, as I just explained, I was like, no, he never owned it. Why would he do that? <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you can speak to, like, how, how did you obtain this uh, Bronco? Well, we work with individuals. Mostly we work with law enforcement, a lot of lawyers, family members, uh, victims when appropriate, um, survivors. It, it's it's really about personal relationships is how we get most of our collection. Very cool. And how are you able to verify that the artifacts are authentic? Well, since it is an, an individual thing, it's mostly about the context of where the item came from, verifying the source and If the person turns out to be legit and is able to lay out a provenance that makes sense, then then that's that's the best way to verify an object's authenticity about doing research on on the source. And what is your position there? Do you perform any of those hands on uh, verifications? Yeah, that's what I do. Um, My official title is director of artifacts and exhibits, and that covers. A multitude of sins. Um, <laughs> I do. I write content for exhibit displays. I um, acquire artifacts. I research artifacts. Um, I work with our lenders. I, I do a little bit of everything. So uh, if, if a new display goes out, I'm the one that that wrote the labels, and likely the person that also installed it. Very cool. Now, uh, I'm looking on on your website at some of these artifacts. You have something called the Massachusetts Electric Chair Helmet. 
Can you tell us a little bit about that? We have a gallery on capital punishment. Um, we have a gallery on prisons as well, but capital punishment is, of course, part of our, our legal system here in America. So we have things like uh, the Tennessee electric chair uh, that was used 125 times. So that's that's the biggest piece because it's an entire chair. Mm. But then we have various pieces, as you just mentioned, from from various other electric chairs throughout the throughout the country um, over time. Um, we also have a lethal injection machine. Ooh, what's that like? So for that, it's it's a little bit hard to explain. I think we have photos on our website, but it's it's basically is a big silver machine with a bunch of buttons on it. Um, there would be two of those. We have one, but there would be two. And two different people would be running through hitting the same buttons on the same machines for the releasing the different kinds of drugs. Um, that's so neither of them, they have, they have deniability between them Mm -hmm. who actually release the drugs. They don't know. And so it has a specific protocol for hitting the buttons, um, on each, on each machine uh, that releases them. So we have one of those machines. Do you ever like uh, strap a tardy employee down uh, to one of these uh, machines? <laughs> we make lots of jokes about how much, how many jail cells and handcuffs we have around the museum, for sure. <laughs> we have several prison cells. <laughs> um, lots of parents like to joke about leaving their children or their spouses all the time. <laughs> Uh, we we do have real handcuffs throughout the museum in different areas in the in the booking room where you can get fingerprinted and things like that. Uh, the problem with the real handcuffs is the handcuff keys are pretty much universal um, for real handcuffs, and so you can double lock handcuffs so that they can't be made tighter. So we do that. However, a lot of we do have a lot of law enforcement that comes through the museum and they want to see if they're real. And of course they're real. So they unlock them and then leave them unlocked. And then of course, unbeknownst to us, the next kid or whoever comes along and locks themselves in handcuffs and then can't get out. Um, so we get lots of calls about kids locking themselves in handcuffs and we have to go let them out. Um, it's not a big deal, but we, we do have some fun with it. Sometimes depend, we might joke that, we oh, no, we have to call the police. <laughs> <laughs> freak, freak some people out. But no, they, they, the rest of their family gets an amazing story out of it. I, I feel like I would get locked in the handcuffs if I went there. I feel like I wouldn't be able yeah. to help myself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you find them open, it's a, it's a perfectly understandable reaction. It's more mm, like, stop unlocking really. our handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to stop myself. I would see it and I would just see my hand go up into it. I'd see my other hand close it and I'd be like, I can't believe I just did that to myself. Yeah, you would, you would know what was going to happen, but it was inevitable for sure. Right. I feel like instinctually I, I would not put my hand in a handcuff. <laughs> it's the difference between uh, you and I. <laughs> that is uh, that's pretty interesting. It probably says something about whether or not you've been in them for real before. <laughs> ah, there uh, we go. <laughs> don't don't you dare bring up my criminal history, Rachel. <laughs> Sometimes a lot of people ask, like, so how did you get into crime? And I'm like, well, that's that's not a <laughs> that's not a thing. That's you know, my my background is in museum studies and history, and I wanted to work at a museum. It wasn't because I am a criminal. You don't or... answer <laughs> if, if I told you I'd have to kill you? <laughs> what? Exactly, exactly. You said that you had a, uh, a the Tennessee electric chair that was 125 years old? 125 executions. Oh, I'm sorry, 125 executions. Is that still yeah. functional? N- no. I wouldn't say I've tried. <laughs> if you plugged it in, maybe. I have not actually been asked that question. I'll be honest. I mean, I am sure that the right person could make it functional. I guess in theory it's possible, but it's been a very, very, very long time. It's probably... Here's what we'll any, do. Uh, anything's possible. We'll, we'll, we'll do a Crawl Space Live episode. It'll be, it'll be Facebook Live. 
Uh, Tim and I will go down there. I'll sit in Old Sparky, and we'll see. We'll we'll give it one shot. We'll see what happens. Facebook Live. I'll push the uh, the lever, and I don't mind. You know, having no deniability. <laughs> It'll just be me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so is, speaking of old Sparky, we, uh, we were talking about this on a recent episode and, um, I like how barbaric does, does the, the whole, uh, setup feel or, or look to you, uh, the, uh, of, you know, uh, corporal punishment, uh, obviously killing someone through electrocution. I mean, we do, we do explain the process for each different thing. We actually start with some medieval methods. In the same room, we have a reproduction of a guillotine as well. Mm. Uh, so we do try to explain that it might seem a little bit odd to us now, but each form of execution came about from an attempt by the powers that be to make execution more humane. So... Hanging came about because they wanted to make it more humane than beheadings and draw and quarter and all of that. And electric chair was created because they wanted something more humane than hanging. And gas chamber from electric chair and lethal injection from gas chamber and so on. Uh, So it is interesting to think about it from that perspective that even though it is still legal um, in a number of states, it does sort of lay out that idea that it, yeah, it might seem odd, but they were trying to make it more, more humane while they still believed that it was necessary. They were looking for ways to make it as effortless and harm harmless when killing someone as, as possible. So it is, it is interesting to explore those areas. Is there a particular artifact that the guests just feel uncomfortable around? Probably the most would be, um, John Wayne Gacy's clown suits, uh, but that would have a lot to do with people's clown phobia. I, it's, True. Those those things are those things are sort of in, intertwined. Um, I'm not sure how much one relates to the other. I'm sure in in just the general pop culture idea they're connected because a lot of people think clown killer. Um, but as far as we know, he never actually killed anyone dressed up as a clown. The clown was his positive alter ego, uh, where he did good deeds and went to hospitals for kids and was in parades and that sort of thing. The when he was killing people was when he was looking like a regular guy wearing a leather jacket, which we also have on display. Um, so that's what we try to explain in that area as well. It's like, yeah, this is what you're afraid of, but the person you should be afraid of is just your regular Joe Schmo on the street. Um, it's not like they advertise. Serial killers don't generally advertise themselves in that way. Um, the <laughs> yeah. same with Ted Bundy. I mean, they could be attractive um, and just being aware of how to, you know, be smart um, in situations and how to keep yourself safe. Uh, but it's it's definitely the clown suits that that freak people out the most. So, Rachel, if you were on death row, what would your last meal be? Good question. We do we do have a a, a panel in the museum that talks about a lot of famous last meals. Oh man, I would probably uh, there would be a pasta. There would be an Alfredo sauce in there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> with with pizza. I don't know. That's the thing. You can have several quote unquote meals as your last meal all piled on together. A lot of them are fairly similar because people have their typical favorite foods. They're, they're lobsters. They're, you know, that kind of thing. Man, I don't know. It would be what I was feeling at the moment. That's a hard question to fake. <laughs> you never know what you never know what you're craving at that moment. <laughs> Maybe here's a better question. Would you eat your last meal? Oh yeah. I'm a foodie. <laughs> I love food. Okay. I'm a There's foodie. no question of that. <laughs> oh, I I'm I'm a foodie. I'm an emotional eater. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We were recently uh, talking with uh, our buddy about uh, Ted Bundy, who um, chose a last meal but didn't actually eat it. 
Um, and uh, then that reminds me of some famous last words that people have. Do you have anything um, noting uh, last words um, in the electric uh, in the electric chair or anything? Again, that I mean, that's just even that you're asking that question is just a funny little example of how issues of of crime and capital punishment have entered our culture that something like famous last words is even a common a common phrase people don't think about <laughs> the meaning behind it right and uh yeah I, br- I, br- I bring it up because john wayne gacy's last words were kiss my ass <laughs> yes that is true yes you're right which is one of my favorites <laughs> yes yes has Absolutely. anything been anonymously donated to the museum? No. You you would maybe think so. Um, sometimes, sometimes when people donate things, they don't want to be credited for it, such as like saying on the label donated by so-and-so. Um, but we obviously know who they are because we wouldn't put something out there without knowing its source and its authenticity. Um so it, that wouldn't really be a thing, um, donating something completely anonymously. It might be anonymous to the public, but it wouldn't be anonymous to us. Now, uh, what is the Natalie Holloway Resource Center? So, of course, you're familiar with Natalie Holloway, yes. uh, who, went, who went missing in Aruba and is still officially a cold case, even though we know who did it. Allegedly, Rachel. Don't be yes, careful. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he's 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 admitted it and recanted many many times, and also tried to blackmail her mother. In if you give me money, I'll tell you where her body is. Um, but then he was arrested for the murder, another murder, before that ended up happening. That's right. You're talking about Joran Vandersloot. Yes. Yes. You're on Vandersloot. And so a number of years ago, um, we teamed up with her mother um, to start the Nally Holloway Resource Center um, to bring awareness to uh, safe travel, the buddy system. Um, a lot of you know, Natalie might be with us here today if there had been better education for going on school trips of of not leaving your friends, being more wary of handsome strangers, like we talked about with Bundy and those sort of things, um, and how to keep yourself safe when you're traveling um, in a strange city or a foreign country, um, as well as helping people when they go missing of any age. I mean, there's been so many, there's so much great work around children, um, but people even, the, the, the issue with Natalie, she was over 18. She was 18. So it completely changes things. While we might still think of that as a child, <laughs> um, legally um, it changed things. So um, helping people when family members or friends go missing at any age. Um, so that's what the Natalie Holloway Research Center uh, works on. Well, that is a fantastic cause to champion. Good, good, good work with that. Well, we try to we try to do what we can in bringing awareness to a lot of safety issues that maybe don't seem obvious to everyone. My last question is: If you are planning on attending CrimeCon 2019 in New Orleans? Oh man, that is the question. I don't know yet. Drive the Bronco over. Come on, you're within driving oh, distance. Yeah. <laughs> but but you have to you have to go twenty five miles an hour. Yeah, right. Um, well, that's not going to happen <laughs> because we are a museum. Slap on the clown suit. Get in the Bronco. We, we like to keep things safe. <laughs> um, the 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 thing about museums is you have to remember if it was up to the conservators to keep things safe and never deteriorating, they would be in a pitch black room at all times. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Anything else is downhill from there, let alone outside. <laughs> so, yeah. So we had a great time in Nashville. Obviously it was in Tennessee, so it wasn't that far for us. Um, I don't, I can't say specifically hundred percent whether we'll be at, in New Orleans, uh, but we had a great time and it would certainly be a lot of fun to come again. Um, yeah. 
it, it would be a lot of fun. We'll just have to see. I guess this means you're going. <laughs> oh, we'll be there. Oh, we are crime con. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. I I just lied. I said that was my last question, but your answer made me think of another question. Are people able to sit inside the Bronco or sit inside uh, Ted Bundy's car or any of the vehicles? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the, the tar- dark room and no touching and white gloves and all that kind of stuff. No. And, and, and I mean, it's, when you think about it, I mean, in both of those cases, I mean, there were, there were victims involved, like people died. And and so people taking selfies inside something like that um, doesn't seem entirely respectful to their memory. So that's, that's not something that we would do. Right. Awesome. Good answer. Well, thank you for existing. I I think it's a really cool uh, place. So check out crimemuseum.org. And if you are in the Pigeon Forge, Tennessee area, you must visit it. And if you're not in the Pigeon Forge, Tennessee area, maybe you should get yourself to the Pigeon Forge, Tennessee area. It's a wonderful vacation location. (laughs) Come come see us. Go to Dollywood. It's a good time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. It's been uh, it's been really fun and informative. Uh, is there anything that um, you'd like to direct people's attention to aside from, you know, the uh, the, the website and the Natalie Holloway uh, Foundation? Uh, no, I mean, people can find us at crimemuseum.org or alcatrazeast.com. Um, find more about we always have new artifacts coming out, new um, temporary exhibits. We do temporary exhibits two times a year and rotate our objects. We're always collecting new things. Uh, so if you think you've already seen the museum, if you saw it in D.C., uh, there's a lot that's totally different in Tennessee. And um, we're always bringing in new things. So come check us out. 